So welcome everybody <laughs> to another Wine Down Wednesday. Uh, this week we are headed to New Zealand and some of you who were on the call like five minutes ago heard me talk about how I was able to travel quite a bit in New Zealand uh, back in 2017. And I was able to visit so many parts uh, or so many wine regions within the country. And I really, I really love this country. Um, it is, it really does have something for everyone. It is naturally beautiful. The towns are super interesting. Uh, it actually has a lot of culture and history and they've done a very good job of uh, highlighting their indigenous cultures and the origins of the island. And we'll even get to talk a little bit about that this evening. Uh, so with that, I'm going to share my screen with you guys and we are hopping on a plane and taking Air New Zealand down to Auckland. It is a long flight to get there, but fortunately we have direct flights. And from there, from Auckland, you can pretty much get anywhere else in New Zealand, whether it's Queenstown, Wellington, Christchurch, anywhere on either of the islands. So that makes it really uh, accessible for us here in Texas. And we, just because it doesn't, we don't have to be switching up uh, up flights a whole lot. Um, so when we get to New Zealand, we are typically arriving into Auckland first. The flight does get in at like 5.45 in the morning. So you can spend a night in Auckland or you can just hop right on your next flight and head on to your next destination. The Maori were the first people to arrive in New Zealand and they are a huge part of the, the culture on both islands. Uh, if any of you guys have ever watched rugby, the All Blacks team is New Zealand's team and they do the Maori war dance before they get their game started. And it's pretty intimidating, uh, but it's a really cool thing to watch. Uh, Abel Tasman was the first European to visit the country and he, uh, he was from the Netherlands, but he was not the person who actually claimed the country, the British did that. And so the island has, a more interesting history that we can dive into. And I thought it would be fun to share a little bit about the Polynesian history. So we are a little bit familiar with Hawaii and French Polynesia, just as these beautiful destinations that are great for snorkeling and for like remote beach getaways. And if any of you guys have seen the, the movie, the children's uh, movie Moana, you know that she uh, ends up calling the god Maui, who is the Polynesian god who uh, actually used his giant fish hook to fish the islands out of the sea. And so according to the Maori mythology, this is the origin of the islands. And it's something that is really, they're, they're really tied to that cultural history there. And you can participate in Maori cultural events there. So many people on the island have that Maori heritage and they are super proud of it. And lots of names uh, throughout New Zealand will have Maori names and then they'll have Kiwi names. And the pronunciation can be kind of tough but once you sort of get the hang of it and know what to expect, it flows a little bit easier. So with that, let's jump right into wine country. And we're going to focus on the, the South Island today. Uh, we're flying from Auckland down to the South Island to, to start this journey. There are a bunch of wine regions uh, in the North Island, but that's for, that's for another wine down Wednesday. So Adele, take it away. Tell us a little bit about these regions and uh, what we'll be drinking today. Hello. Um, so we're drinking New Zealand wine today. I'm, I'll be the first to admit, it's not usually one of my go-to favorite regions when I'm thinking of enjoying a glass of wine, but I do think that there's some really interesting history and some interesting wines out there today. So if you did pick up the wines from us, uh, I tried to choose some things that were maybe a little bit off the beaten path or not your usual style. I figure anyone can go to the store and pick up a bottle of Kim Crawford and sip along with us, but I try to pick some cool things. Um, 
we don't know um, a whole lot about winemaking um, in New Zealand in, in the fact of, um, compared to like other countries like France and Italy where it's been happening for hundreds and hundreds of years uh, because the history is extremely brief in New Zealand. There was this temperance movement called the six o'clock six swill where all of the bars and pubs had to close at six o'clock uh, in, in order to have the gentlemen go home to their wives and not be, you know, too snockered uh, and to be respectable, whatever. In my mind, if the bar was gonna close at six o'clock, even if it was in the afternoon uh, or early evening, I, I still feel like you could equally get pretty drunk before then too. Uh, but this temperance movement, movement, it started during World War II and it lasted all the way into the late sixties. So winemaking is very, very far behind in compared to like other regions. Um, one of the effects of having this temperance movement on the wine um, industry is that the growers decided to plant a lot of like low quality fruit just in case at some point it switched and they had to sell table grapes or wine grapes. They kind of did hybrids of both. So the quality wasn't great for wine making, but in a flash if they needed to, if like some law passed, um, they could just sell them as table grapes and they were still sweet and delicious enough right off the vine to eat. But that's not necessarily how you make really good quality wines. Uh, in you know the late seventies, the number one grape grown throughout the country was called Albany Surprise. Sounds awful. Uh, <laughs> what was, does that mean? <laughs> it was a sweet black grape that was used for either winemaking or it could be used for table grapes, but it was a hybrid of a couple different grape species. So it, it wasn't the best. Uh, so of course, New Zealand has that reputation of like making so-so wines, um, but it really wasn't until after that temperance movement stopped that uh, people were able to sort of focus back on planting, planting quality grapes in quality zones, um, international um, attention and people with investors and money and stuff like that were able to come to the region and then really make a go of things. Um, just as an example, uh, wine shops weren't even allowed to sell wine until 1955. So New Zealand is quite far behind like the rest of the winemaking world uh, in, in comparison. Um, nowadays, you know, New Zealand's vineyard acreage is well over 38,000 when it used to be only 400. So everything is just consistently year after year getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more important uh, and better quality. Uh, so if you're looking at this map here, uh, it's kind of interesting to see like how New Zealand is situated compared to the rest of like the wine making world. Uh, and again, this is the, the southern hemisphere, so you almost think of things, you know, flipped. Um, New Zealand is the easternmost and the southernmost wine making country in the entire world. Um, the North Island lies on that same latitude as Tasmania. So last week when we were doing Australia, we had that map and Tasmania is just the island south of Australia. That's the same latitude, but just 1200 miles of ocean from the North Island. So going even further south uh, from there is the South Island and that lies at the 45th parallel. Uh, something that I think is really interesting about this is that if you're tying comparisons of other really famous, really good wine making regions in the world, there's one commonality in the Northern Hemisphere and it's called the Magic Line, and that is the 45th parallel. You've got Piedmont in Italy on the 45th parallel. You go over, you've got Rhone, you've got Bordeaux, and then in the New World, you've got Willamette Valley, Oregon, and they all fall along the same latitude of the world and produce excellent wines. So flipping that now to the Southern Hemisphere, you've got Central Otago down there on the South Islands making excellent quality Pinot Noirs, but nowhere else really gets quite as far south as Central Otago. There's parts of Chile and Argentina that are close to the 45th parallel, uh, but Central Otago in the South Islands sort of takes the cake to that one. Um, the South Island sees a lot of sunlight hours. You can see how all of the wine regions that are there uh, that are color coded on your map, uh, they're all on the Eastern coast. Uh, and the main reason for that is that the uh, rain shadow effect happens on that side of the mountains. The mountains are, are called the Southern Alps. So you could really maybe confuse someone saying, oh, we're going skiing in the Southern Alps. <laughs> it's actually the mountain range in New Zealand and not actually like the, the, uh, the Southern Alps. Um, 
but the uh, the rain shadow moves eastward. So all the rain happens high in the mountains. And then after that, on that eastern coast is much drier and much sunnier. So you'll see all of the vineyards sort of planted um, within a short distance of the coast. So with that, let's get into tonight's wines. And why don't you tell us a little bit about how, uh, about the region of Marlboro and the wines that we're drinking from there today? Um, so we're going to do three wines today. We're going to do a Sauvignon Blanc sparkling. It's called The Doctors. Um, and then we're going to do a wild Sauvignon Blanc, which is uh, something that's a little bit off the beaten path for Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand. And then we're going to finish with Cashburn and we have a special guest uh, from them today. Um, but if we were to perhaps look at Marlboro more in depth, uh, here it is. And that is our first stop for today. And if you think of Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, you have to think of Marlboro. It, they're synonymous with each other. Uh, the grapes were first planted in 1975, uh, but it wasn't until 85 that Cloudy Bay Vineyards took off. They were like the winery that really put Marlboro New Zealand on the map, specifically for the style of Sauvignon Blanc that's achieved in Marlboro. It's racy and it really became this international sensation. If you're thinking of other places that make Sauvignon Blanc, you've got California, like Napa Valley, you've got France, the Loire Valley, and then of course you've got New Zealand. And the main styles kind of between them is that New Zealand always has that big, tropical, easy drinking fruit forward. France is more mineral driven, a little bit more reserved, like laser acidity and, and a notable chalkiness to it. Um, and then California, specifically like from like Napa Valley, they tend to oak age a lot of things too. So you get more of that oaky, smoky styles. So honing into Marlboro, New Zealand, they do something that's unique to the rest of the world. Uh, the region of Marlboro itself though, I mean, they produce 70% of all of the wine that's coming out of New Zealand. They have the market cornered. Um, other grapes that they grow here, Pinot, Pinot Gris, Merlot, Riesling, a little bit of Gewürztraminer, which I've heard they call groovy instead of Gewürztraminer. They would. Uh, <laughs> they would yeah, like an abbreviation. Um, and sometimes they do some sparkling wines as well, uh, which are pretty, per, you know, are pretty good. And we're going to taste one here shortly. Um, I want to jump in really quickly because we like to talk about having our aha moments with wine and tasting Sauvignon Blanc side by side was my aha moment. I tasted a Marlboro Sauvignon Blanc, a Sancerre, and then a California Sauvignon Blanc. And that was the first time I really understood uh, Tewa and how the same grape can be so different depending on the soil, depending on the climate, depending on the part of the, where, the world where it comes from. And it is so fun to kind of get back into this again. We we did the Lar Valley, we did Sancerre uh, in one of our, I think one of our very first Wine Down Wednesdays. And uh, it's exciting to, to be visiting Marlboro tonight and kind of getting back to that, uh, to, to my wine origins, I guess. I feel like when someone's drinking a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc because it's so distinguishable and it's like a highly aromatic wine that you'll be like walking by a table like while you're at work and you're like oh I can smell it I smell it they're they're drinking Sauv Blanc from New Zealand it's like you can smell it almost like like far away because it's just so very specific mm -hmm. I definitely had one of my aha moments too it's like one of the first times successfully blind tasting a wine I was like put my nose in it tasted it I was like I know exactly where this is from this is exactly New Zealand Sauv Blanc stereotypical so tell us a little bit about the doctors and a little bit about this wine, a little bit about where it's from in Marlboro and what is exciting about it. So I've got mine still in the chiller. I'm going to pop it open right now. It's got a cute little bottle top on it, which I'm excited about for easy opening. <laughs> nice. Ooh, it's got a good little fizz to it. Awesome. Uh, so this is a project um, called The Doctors, and it's by two doctors. Go figure. Uh, their names are John and Bridget, and they actually have a main winery. It's called Forest Estate. Uh, the Doctors is kind of like a, an offshoot of uh, the Forest Estate uh, that they do a lot of other wine making out of. Uh, but both doctors were molecular biologists who sort of like left it all behind to go pursue making wine and, and growing great grapes. 
And if you can see like on the map or on the picture here of like the facility and the vineyards and those mountains in the background, I mean, who wouldn't leave it all behind? It's gorgeous. It looks amazing. Like I would love to go live there and just like hang out, beautiful skies and everything like that. So, um, so this one I wanted to show is an interesting example of sparkling style Sauvignon Blanc. Um, the wines from Marble Museum, they, they tend to show like a lot of like vibrancy and fruit and razor sharp acidity and things that have really good acid to them make really good sparkling wines. Uh, it's like the acidity is able to like withstand the sparkling process uh, to, to shine and, and, and to age and just be great, you can still taste good wine underneath it. So when I first put my uh, nose into this glass, the very first thing that I get is just almost like a, like a green jalapeno kind of thing, along with like big tropical fruits. It's like a guava, it's like sparkling guava jalapeno juice. Ooh. Are you drinking this one, Kristen? No, I uh, try to only do one bottle a night. So <laughs> I, I went with the red today. Cool. Uh, this wine's also, it's 10% alcohol. So if you were to change your mind, you could totally finish the whole bottle and Perfect. only be. <laughs> you you know, I, I convinced myself of that with the, with the Silkman wine from last week, the day after I was like, oh, it's okay if I drink the whole bottle, it's only 10%. And Jonathan, my husband was like, I don't think that's the best idea that you've had. <laughs> and Maybe uh, not on a Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's just a little bit though. <laughs> the weekend's fine though, anything goes. <laughs> yeah. So this is one of the only sparkling Sauvignon Blancs that I've ever really come across. And actually like way back in the day, we actually served this and poured it by the glass. But it was been a, it's been a long time since I've seen this. And so when I was doing some research trying to like find some cool off the beaten path wines, I was like, ooh, let's just grab, let's just grab this and then and go with it. So I uh, hope everyone is enjoying because it is, probably the perfect pairing with a hot summer's day because it is fruity it's refreshing uh it's got and great it's light it, and it's light and it's yeah low in alcohol for all sure day. you're all day drinking so let's talk a little bit more about marlboro and what there is to do besides drinking wine obviously it is one of the, it, it is the largest wine growing region in uh, New Zealand, but there is a lot more to it. I actually was able to visit when I was there and I explored wine region in the area, but one of my favorite parts was visiting Marlboro Sounds. So it is a fantastic place to eat, to enjoy the wine and to get really active as well. Uh, I, did, I didn't hire a bike when I was there, but I did do parts of the Queen Charlotte track. And so New Zealand is known for having some really great walks around the country and you can do them over the course of several days or you can do some of them out and back. And so to do the Queen Charlotte track, you can only access it via boat or by foot. And so we took a little boat into the start and then walked along the this beautiful coast and you just have these incredible vistas everywhere and then ended at a little uh a little lodge and had a couple of drinks and then took the boat back through the sounds back to uh to Picton which is uh the little town where we started from and one thing that is super cool about these sounds is the wildlife that you see. So you can see dolphins, you can see lots of unique uh, birds that are uh, indigenous to New Zealand. But the most fascinating thing, and in my opinion, the most exciting thing that you just so happen to stumble upon in the sounds is orca whales. And so you can see that fin kind of start to go out. And once you get a little bit uh, farther out of the sounds into the water, you have more of those whale watching opportunities. And this is just a fantastic little place. If you were to combine this, uh, a trip to New Zealand and wanted to do both islands, if you didn't want to fly, you can actually take a ferry from Picton over to Wellington, which is at the south end of the North Island. And Wellington is a super fun little city, uh, which kind of shows you a different side of New Zealand's food, wine, and beer culture. Uh, some of my favorite places to stay in the area are the Bay of Many Coves and the Marlboro Lodge. I always like to give you guys some tips on where you could actually post up while you're here. And 
you can be right on the water with beautiful views in these secluded areas or right in wine country with vineyard access right out of your door where you can hop out and either start touring the vineyards by bike or renting a car or however. Uh, biking in New Zealand is something that's also super easy and this isn't high terrain mountain biking. Uh, lots of the wineries throughout the country in each wine region are really well connected by bike paths and they're very protected as well and safe. Uh, so you can do that pretty easily. I did it not in Marlboro, but I'll tell you guys a little bit about that later. So while we're still here in this part of the, uh, of the country, let's dive into our second wine today and learn a little bit more about uh, wild Sauvignon Blanc and what stands out about this particular wine. Fun, okay, so here's the next wine. Mm -hmm. It is the Grey Wacky. And I had this one on ice too. It's got a screw top on it. And I just want to just talk about screw caps for just a quick minute. There's a fancy way to open them that I was shown. Uh, if you are presenting them at the table, instead of just unscrewing it, they say to unscrew the neck first and then remove the top. Ooh, fancy pants. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? But almost all Sauvignon Blanc and actually most all New Zealand wines and a lot of Australian wines have screw caps as their uh, enclosure. And these guys are ready to drink. No fancy no, contraptions. No, it's easy access. Pop it off and get, yeah. get busy. And so there's some pluses and minuses of, of screw caps, of course. The main con is that it doesn't always look pretty. People associate it with cheap wines. Um, but screw caps are actually pretty cool. Um, from the technology standpoint, um, you've got your metal aluminum alloy outside, but then on the inside is um, just like a, a wadding or like a padding um, and like a little bit of like a, a seal. Um, and so one of the main like, drawbacks about screw caps that people used to argue about was that when you have a wine specifically like a red wine that is aged with like a cork in it corks are semi-porous and they allow like a micro oxidation into the wine that improves the wine as it matures and if you have a screw cap like it doesn't really let any oxygen in whatsoever um, so it's just doing like a little bit of reading and what they can actually do is increase the amount of wadding inside of the, the top to be a little bit thicker, which allows for a little bit more oxidation. So you can still have that same effect. Um, what is wadding? Wadding is like, okay, so look inside of your screw cap. There's something inside of there. You might have to get like a pen or something and like get it out, but it's like this squishy stuff, like plasticky something, something. Okay. So that's okay. the that's inside of there. So they can like make that thicker or thinner depending on the amount of oxidation that they want. So it kind of like helps to combat that issue of, or arguments that the wine needs a little bit of oxygen to, uh, to, to properly age. But for the most part, like screw caps, they eliminate the, uh, you know, the, the option just about of, of the wine ever being corked, which I just want to clear up. A wine being corked does not mean that there's cork floating around in the wine. Corked wine means that it has been infected with TCA, which is like a bacterial chemical compound that it just, it happens. Um, and it makes the wine have this weird cardboard box, chlorine, like a, like a cardboard box that's been sitting on the side of a wet swimming pool. And that's the smell of like a corked wine. Um, it doesn't mean that the wine's poisonous. It's not going to hurt you. It's just not as pleasant as it could be. Uh, so screw caps help very much so with that. Um, and they, I mean, these wines are also bulletproof. I mean, like corkscrew wines, they're, you can store them for a very long time because again, like they're, they're fully sealed. Although like a screw cap wine still can be corked. It can happen because cork or that TCA, that bacterial thing, that can occur in like the barrels where the wine is aged. Mm -hmm. So it's not even in the cork only. Gotcha. Uh, but for the most part, I don't like that. I guess that's something that I, uh, I had never considered before. I always thought, oh, uh, screw, top, uh, screw top wines are actually resistant to cork. So that's, uh, they have, but I associated like different types of flaws with 
uh, that could occur with, with those. Um, um, a lot of times, like whenever you pop open a screw cap, sometimes the wine inside of it, especially if it's a very young, fresh wine, will have just a little bit of like a petulance, a little effervescence. Yeah, to, yeah. And sometimes that's just due to like the bottling process. They'll, they'll spritz it with like just a little bit of CO2 just right on top as they put the, uh, the, the metal forms around to make the screw top. And that'll blow off with either a couple years of aging or just open the wine and decant it and it, mm -hmm. all those little bubbles will kind of fall away. But back to the wine, the gray wacky. Um, so this is something that I thought was off the beaten path, not your usual Marlboro New Zealand style Sauvignon Blanc. Um, this is a label of a winemaker whose name is Kevin Judd. And he had this idea of making very like quality focused wine making on specific vineyard sites that have really cool soil types and microclimates. Um, and then using indigenous yeasts that just occur naturally to spontaneously ferment the wines. So spontaneous fermentation of natural yeasts. And then they intentionally leave this wine uh, in contact with the leaves for an additional eight months. So the texture of this is not your usual Sauvignon Blanc. It's a little bit rounder. Um, it's gonna be a little bit fatter and like weightier on the palate. And it's got kind of like a smokiness on the finish. If anyone else is drinking this wine, like it is normal that it's gonna be a little bit smoky. This wine also, as it's fermenting with the yeasts, um, something called lees, which are like the dead yeast cells after fermentation is done, they kind of settle all in the wine. They'll stir them around like every once in a while and it really helps like incorporate that flavor into the wine and adds this really unique texture. Um, and they also, during this fermentation process, um, did it in oak barrels. So you're also getting like a little bit of an oak influence to this wine. So this is not your typical Sauvignon Blanc. I think it's something that's a little bit more specific, different, and interesting. Um, I don't know if anyone else is out there, if anyone has any comments uh, on this one, if they like it or not. I'd like to see what you guys think, because I did want to kind of throw something out there that was off the beaten path. Yeah, guys, yeah, guys. we have the chat box open for everybody. So if you guys do have any questions or want to jump in or share any thoughts or feedback, you guys are 100% welcome to do that. Just so I just also want to mention in this wine is that the alcohol is a little bit higher. It's almost 14%. Um, wow, that is big for a Sauvignon Blanc. It is big for a Sauvignon Blanc, but the amount of residual sugar is very small. Here's mm -hmm. something that people do not realize about a lot of New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs, especially those commercial brands. Kim Crawford has five grams of residual sugar per liter in their wine. Now, flash backwards to when we did the Finger Lakes a couple weeks ago and we had that dry Riesling. That dry Riesling was 0.7%, less than 1% of residual sugar. Kim Crawford has five grams of residual sugar. That's kind of a lot. Now, most like champagne has like between six and 12. Most Riesling, like sweet Riesling has about 20 grams. Um, but some of these big ones, Oyster Bay, Cloudy Bay, Kim Crawford, they have almost five to 6% of residual sugar, which makes them kind of sweet. So when you have that hangover the next day and your head hurts, <laughs> seven above New Zealand all day, it's probably because of the amount of sugar and not necessarily because of the alcohol. So you're telling me because the RS on this is so low that this wine doesn't give you hangovers? No, it, you'll still get hangover it from was worth alcohol. Try. <laughs> it was worth a try. I know. I had someone who came into the bar and was just insistent that like, if they only drank natural wine that they would never get hungover. I mean, you're still drinking alcohol. You're going to have the effects the next day of alcohol leaving the system. It doesn't matter if it's a natural wine or a sulfite free, free wine or whatever. If you get shit faced, <laughs> you might feel like shit the next day. <laughs> uh, that that can happen. <laughs> well, uh, Mar Marlboro is without a doubt New Zealand's biggest wine region, its most well known wine region, but there is so much more to uh, wine country in New Zealand than just Marlboro. So just to the, uh, the west of this area, you have a part of the country that's called Nelson or uh, Golden Bay. And this is one of, 
in my opinion, one of the most underrated and beautiful parts of New Zealand. We have these tourist things in the South Island that we really know about and these tourist spots in the North Island. And so few people visit this, so few Americans visit Nelson and the Abel Tasman Park on their first time on their first trip to New Zealand and this is really where you go if you love beautiful beaches and if you like feeling like you're the only person in the world who's on a beach there are a bunch of other things to do here and the wine here is super interesting as well so this is where I actually had the opportunity to take on the the great taste trail as they call it there and bike my way through wine country and it was super it wasn't flat, but it was very well, it was very well paved and maintained and it was easy to, to do. And I may have cheated and walked my bike up a couple of hills, but uh, the Sauvignon Blanc here is really different where you get that really, I always get that strong grapefruit flavor with uh, the, the Marlboro wines, like really ripe grapefruit and super grassy. And the citrus in the Nelson wines is a lot more subtle to me. We don't have anything to share with you from there today, but we did want to talk about it because it is another important part of the South Island's wine country. And it's absolutely beautiful beyond bike riding. If you do feel a little bit more adventure, adventurous, there are some really cool whitewater rafting and kayaking opportunities uh, at, Murchison, at the Murchison River. Uh, I went horseback riding along the cliffs around Cape Farewell. And you see this little, uh, this little piece of land jut far out into the ocean and it just looks unreal. Uh, and then you can access these hidden beaches over there and see wild seals and uh, wild bird life. And it really is just a beautiful place. This is uh, another part of the country uh, that you can't, you can't drive to these places. You can only access them by boat or by foot. And the Abel Tasman track is one of New Zealand's great walks. I did it and it was, it was gorgeous. And these tracks, it's not like you're camping along the way. There are these little lodges, I mean, you can, but there are these little lodges where you can book a stay at in between your day's hikes. You can also technically do the track by kayak, which is another cool thing to experience. The properties there are really beautiful. You have the Stonefly Lodge, which isn't on the water. You've got Eden House, which is a little bit more centrally located uh, and closer to Nelson. And then Split Apple Retreat. I actually had no idea that it was one of New Zealand's luxury lodges when I was there, but I just kind of found uh, a last minute right there and actually stayed at this property. And it's gorgeous. It's super small. It only has, uh, it has less than 10 rooms, I think, or it, it did a couple of years ago. And you just have these beautiful views of the Abel Tasman National Park. Another important wine, re wine region we wanna to touch on is Christchurch and Canterbury. Most of you guys have probably heard of Christchurch. It is a city that we frequently hear about in the news uh, whenever New Zealand suffers a massive uh, earthquake. This is the, the city that has become super resilient and found ways to live with that kind of volatile environment. Uh, but there are so many amazing things you can do from this city. It's got a fantastic airport that's easy to access from places outside of New Zealand as well. And just outside of town, there is a dark sky reserve and it is the largest one of its kind in the world. And so if you visit on the new moon, that's when there's no moon, you can see absolutely everything. The light from the stars is unreal. Uh, and New Zealand's largest glacier is accessible by foot, bike, and boat here as well. This is something that's super cool to see, and you can try your hands at ice climbing or glacier trekking, and that's something that's really unique there. Then Adele mentioned the Southern Alps a little bit earlier. There are so many wild ways you can travel through the Southern Alps. Arthur's Pass is the highest route that goes through there. And you can do a multi-day bike trail uh, that goes through there. Or New Zealand has the, uh, the Trans-Alpine train that will also take you through there. So you can see this part of the country without necessarily training 
for it physically. And then there are incredible wine, wine regions. There's an incredible wine region down here as well. Uh, this area is kind of known as the Burgundy of New Zealand. You can have some really herbaceous subpar wines, but during the good years, it is amazing. You could taste it side by side with some of the, the best of France and just compare the differences between the two. Uh, and the weather here is really, uh, it, it really, mirrors that of Burgundy where you can have some really good years and some really bad years. The frost can be really bad, but when when the year is good, it's fantastic. And then some of the coolest properties on the South Island are here. Uh, Orahuna Lodge is one of them. There's also a private villa there if you're ever going with a group or with a group of friends or with uh, your family. And it is very quaint. It is tucked away and absolutely lovely. The Hakupu Lodge and tree houses, you have these little mountain tree houses with gorgeous vistas, and all of these are going to be a little bit more outside of town. And then my personal favorite, Annandale, is a bucket list property for myself, and it is an experience in itself. This is about an hour and a half outside of Christchurch, but so worth it. You've got access to all the wineries from there. You can go out on the water, you can see New Zealand's marine life, and you can enjoy just really uh, relaxing food, wine, biking experiences in that part of, uh, of the island. So I'll just touch on Queenstown and Central Otago briefly. We do have a guest with us this evening who's going to share a little bit more, but this is a bucket list destination uh, in New Zealand, in the world, going to Milford Sound, going to Fjordland National Park. Uh, the Milford Track is a super famous walk, uh, multi-day walk through the Milford Sound area. You can take a scenic flight through here and land on the glaciers. You can visit the glowworm caves and see bioluminescence in real life. And there's just a lot to do. If anybody on here is a scuba diver, uh, this is an awesome place for some really cold water dives as well. Uh, when I was here, we saw so much wildlife when we were in the Sound. Uh, saw wal wal uh, walruses. Uh, sea lions, uh, penguins, dolphins were swimming alongside our boat. It was just, it was just magical. It was so cool. Uh, the great walks in Fjordland are world famous. So technically there are nine great walks of New Zealand. We talked a little bit about the Abel Tasman track beforehand. The Kepler track is another one in Fjordland in this national park. And one thing that's fun about these walks is if you do want to get out and about and do some hiking, they aren't super technical. Um, they are accessible for lots of different uh, different levels of fitness. It just and and there are walks where you can do uh, just a day or three days or five days, depending on what your cup of tea is. Uh, the Root Burn Track is kind of like the if if you don't have the time to do the Milford Track. The root bird track is your alternative. It has a lot more elevation than the Milford track, but it's a much shorter hike if, uh, if you just don't have the time. And then we have the Milford track. This is the one that I did, uh, loved it. It was so cool. There is no Wi-Fi at all and there's no uh, cell phone service. And so you actually end up talking to the people who you're hiking with. And it was one of the most interesting experiences. Everybody, was hanging out together, everyone was super friendly, and, uh, and it was just, it was unreal. The weather was awful when we were there, and our guide told us just to embrace the wet and not to puddle jump, and we were soaked to the bone the entire hike, but the cool thing about that was there were waterfalls everywhere. That's not always something you get to see when it's, when the weather's a little bit drier, and then you do get to see the fifth highest waterfall in the world, Sutherland Falls, and the volume that just was coming out of it in uh, when it was so rainy was, it, it didn't even compare to this photo when uh, there was just so much water. Lastly, my favorite place is to stay in, uh, in Queenstown, which is likely where you'll want to base. You've got Blanket Bay Lodge, 
if uh, helicopters don't make you queasy, I recommend taking a helicopter straight into the lodge. Mataquari Lodge is another uh, favorite. And then Minaret Station is the place to go if you want something really secluded and really removed. You can even see the helicopter in that photo. And I think it only has four rooms, so it's very private and it's a place where you can spend a night and just truly connect with nature. And so with that, we're going to move on to our final line today the Cashburn Pinot Noir from Burn Cottage. And we have a guest, Andy, with us this evening, who's going to tell us a little bit about the wine and about Burn Cottage and dive into uh, what there is to do and see in his home a little bit more. So with that, Andy, I would like to invite you to unmute. And I am going to uh, switch my presentation to one that Andy actually prepared uh, for us today. So bear with me just a second and Andy, uh, unmute yourself and introduce yourself um, to, to our friends here today. Well, good morning from sunny Wanaka in central Otago. Good evening in Texas and, uh, wherever else anybody is. Well, it's been fascinating sitting, listening to you talk about New Zealand, because I think it's not till you listen to somebody else talking about your homeland about how exciting it is and I think we get so used to this amazing scenery the, the lifestyle we have here that you sometimes forget you sort of sometimes take it for granted so it's been amazing just to hear the passion in your voice not only for New Zealand but the wines that you've been trying um, I've been fortunate to, to visit John Forrest in Marlborough when I was at university many years ago amazing winemaker amazing wines and Kevin Judd's Wild Sauvignon Blanc is, uh, it's, uh, there's a master of wine in New Zealand. I think he said it's basically, it's, it's Sauvignon Blanc, Jim, but not as we know it, using a Star Trek uh, analogy. Um, <laughs> Kevin's, Kevin's a phenomenal winemaker and has done a huge amount for the New Zealand industry. Um, Kristen, Adele, thank you for letting me hop in here tonight. This is really cool. And thank you everybody else for joining in. Um, so I suppose what I thought I'd do, I'd just give you a quick rundown about Burn Cottage and then take you through for a little bit of uh, what we call in New Zealand a tiki tour, sort of show you some little things in our back door in this region and sort of give you a sort of a bit of a taste for New Zealand, I suppose. Um, so I suppose Andy, I'm going to jump in real quick and invite our guests to uh, type any questions you guys might have in the, in the chat box and I'll jump in and ask Andy as we go. And Andy, you tell me when to move to the next slide. Okie doke. Um, so yeah, so, so Burn Cottage, so we're, um, we're actually American owned. So we're owned by an amazing family based up in Chicago. So Marcus and Diane Savage. So Marcus is a wine importer, an amazing, amazing family, amazing couple. They came to New Zealand back in 2002, bought a fair piece of land, had this vision to grow uh, single vineyard Pinot Noir in, in Central Otago and as Kristen and Adele have been talking about you know Central Otago is this beautiful mountainous area right down the bottom of the South Island you've got the great big southern Alps which run down the backbone of the South Island so you, you have all the rainfall on the west coast where we are about a hundred miles inland from the sea it, it's really dry you know we get about 18 inches of rain a year so it's, it's a pretty much a desert but what we get is beautiful warm days during the growing season but we get really cool cool evenings so Pinot Noir has really proved itself to be the great variety for Central Otago and now we have about 75 percent of the wine made here is, is Pinot Noir let's we skip forward a wee bit and we'll show you just a few pics here so yeah, we're sort of narrowing it down. And as, as Adele was talking about before, Central Otago sits pretty much on the 45th parallel. And it's, you can sort of see here, it's this big series of mountains and valleys and rivers and lakes. And if we pop forward a little view of the vineyard that we planted back in 2003. So pretty. And if we skip forward one more, we'll get an even better shot of what it's Who are oh, these guys? So these, these, these are the, these are our um, Highland cattle. So this is the vineyard in the middle of winter. So you can see how cold it gets here. So we're a, you know, Burn Cottage is a biodynamically run vineyard. So 
the uh, Highland cattle all part of that and having some diversity on the vineyard. They're really good uh, at producing poop, which is great for composting, which is obviously goes back into the land to help nourish the soils and, and give the vines, you know, some healthy soils to live in. Um, should we pop forward one more? And here's the crew hard at work. So everything we do, there's no machine harvesting for us. It's all hand-picked. So you can see in the left-hand side of the picture there is Olivia, who uh, uh, was our assistant winemaker for six years. She's just left us or is about to leave us to go and do her own project with her partner. So that's really exciting that they've just bought um, eight hectares of, of established vineyards. So they're going to be making their own wine in a couple of years, which we're all super excited about. And the lady standing next to her is our winemaker. So that's Claire Mulholland. So Claire has been making wine in Central Otago on and off the good part of 20 plus years. She spent a good bit of time in Burgundy and in Oregon. Andy, um, can you tell us a little bit about the vine plantings running north to south versus east to west? Yeah, so obviously in, in the southern hemisphere, north, north, you know, your north-facing vines are really important because then you get the, the, the full impact of the sun. East-west, you're going to get shading on one side and the other. So for us in Central Otago, it's really important to get that north-south facing because really here, if you look at old viticultural texts, it talks about not being able to grow basically below the sort of 40th parallel, but obviously we're proving that you can. So exposure to sun is, is important. So we did that when we established the Burn Cottage Vineyards. You know, everything was established facing, mm -hmm. facing north south. Um, and hey, yeah, I have a question too. Sure. So uh, just I just out of my own curiosity, like compared to like acreage of like vineyards, you, you said that one of your people was about to leave. Um, are things more less expensive land wise than like? Napa or Bordeaux or Piedmont. I don't know. Like, what is vineyard pricing if, if one was to want to invest in a vineyard? If you're a wise person, you probably wouldn't invest in a vineyard. It's, <laughs> it's not a. It's, <laughs> I think any any winemaker, any winery owner will tell you that you know it's um it's a great way to spend a lot of money to make a big fortune into a small fortune. But I think what we have in Central Otago is a lot of small growers. You know, most of us are relatively small. You know, we, we only have 16 hectares. So what's that, about 39 acres? So we're all really small, but we're really passionate about what we do. And to, to really to grow grapes in Central Otago, you have to want to be here and make it work because it's a really, you know, it's an extreme environment. You know, we get warm days, really cold evenings during the summer, but then we get really cold winters. And, you know, you, you can't, crop high here you have to be focused at the high end of the market so it's about doing things and doing things properly and really focusing on everything that you do to try and be you know exemplary in everything that you do here but also what it what it brings to this region is a really collaborative approach and a really collegiate environment so there's a lot of sharing goes on there's a lot of you know, we do little projects with another winery. We make wine from somebody else's vineyard. They take a little bit of fruit from us and make a parcel of wine of our vineyard. And we share knowledge, we share information. So I think it's, it is an expensive part of the world to be, but I don't think it's anywhere near as expensive as, as Napa or Bordeaux or places like that. But, you know, in relative terms to New Zealand dollars, yeah, it's an expensive part of the world to be growing. But, you know, when you have the scenery and the lifestyle that we have here, it makes it all worthwhile. Definitely. So Andy, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your wines? I, before, before you joined us, uh, I was telling everybody how I remember drinking one of the Burn Cottage wines back at 13 Celsius in either 2013 or 2014. And this was the wine that turned me on to New Zealand Pinot Noir. Uh, before I had these wines, I kind of had written it off as just a super light a super light fruit juice and uh this wine really changed my perspective and uh and i absolutely love it cool yeah it's nice having those little aha moments isn't it when you you try something and you go okay this has changed my whole perception about this style of wine or this region or this the sub region um but I suppose to be fair, you know, in some ways, you know, Central Otago has only been really making wine for the last 35 years on a commercial level. 
So it's been a lot of, lot of evolution and development and, and learnings as we've gone along. And I suppose for us, when Marcus and Diane set up the vineyard, they brought in a good friend of theirs from, from Northern California, funnily, funnily enough, who had had you know, decades of experience across the States and in Burgundy. And so I suppose we, we took his collective knowledge, plus we also drew on the knowledge of a lot of local expertise to develop the vineyard and look at the way we were going to make our wines as well. So I suppose we probably set out with a little bit of a, a different sort of mindset. Um, and so for us, it wasn't just about making a wine that was just you know lots of fruit and alcohol. For us, it was about having something that had a bit more structure, that had really lovely tannin weight, but retain that freshness and delicacy that we see uh, in this region and, and pretty much across New Zealand with Pinot Noir as well. And I suppose for us, the focus, the, the focus for us day in, day out is our single vineyard focus. You know, so the wine we've got up on the screen at the moment, that's our baby. Mm -hmm. The whole reason that we came about. Um, I think this was the wine. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is essentially a parcel selection from across the Burn Cottage Vineyard. These are the best parcels of wine that we bring together that we think represents the best from the vineyard and also captures the characteristic of the vineyard as well. Um, and this is this is the whole reason we yeah this is the whole reason we we live sleep breathe is, is for this this wine. Um, Moonlight Race is, is this the second little wine that we make and. In the States at the moment, you've got 2016. So 2016 is the little parcel from three vineyards. So the Burn Cottage Vineyard, which is our estate vineyard. And then up until 2017, uh, we were taking fruit from two small growers as well. So it's essentially a little parcel from three little vineyards, all within our sort of local region, um, within sort of six or seven miles of Cromwell. Okay. And it's named after this beautiful old water race that comes from the top of the Pisa Range. So the Pisa Range basically runs down the backbone of where we, we grow. And Central Otago is famous for obviously Pinot Noir. It's really famous for its, its stone fruit, for its cherries, its apricots, its peaches. But it's also famous for the amount of gold that came out of this region. And the gold miners used to divert small streams in the mountains to bring water down into the lower parts of the valley to wash out their sluices. And so the Moonlight Race is one of those existing water races that comes down through to the valley floor. And ourselves and five or six other properties on Burn Cottage Road have access to water from the Moonlight Race. So okay. here's the name. Tell us a little bit about uh, the artwork on the labels. Sure. So we've got an amazing designer who, ironically, is Australian. <laughs> um, you know, they've done an amazing job. So the Burn Cottage label itself was all based around um, a piece of writing by Wolfgang Goethe, um, who's a philosopher. And the piece of writing is called The Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily, which is adorned on the label. And it's basically a piece of writing that sort of talks about balance, you know, and achieve greatness in your life is about having balance in your physical world and balance in your spiritual world. Now this guy called Rudolf Steiner, who you'll probably know from the Steiner schools of education. Oh yes, we do. Yeah. We know that name. Yeah, yeah. So Steiner is also the godfather of biodynamics. And so when he was developing his philosophies around biodynamics, one of the pieces of literature that really influenced him was the Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily by Goethe. And so we look at it that it has connections back to the way we manage the vineyard, you know, the, to have the best grapes that we can produce. It's not only about having healthy vines, but it's about having healthy soils. It's having a diverse ecosystem. It's nurturing the soil, it's nurturing the land, but it's also ensuring that there's biodiversity across the, the, the vineyard and also it gives people an enjoyable place to work in as well. So uh, that's the connection with the, with the Burn Cottage Vineyard label. The Moonlight Race, obviously we're drawing on um, the Moonlight Race. So there's the elements of nature there. There's this, the water symbols as well. And then we get to Cashburn. 
Which is so, online today. Which is what you should have in the glass, hopefully. Um, I'm a little bit jealous because I've got this stuff. <laughs> it's, it's early where you are. It's what, it a little after 11 a.m.? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I have, to, I have to actually drive into the winery this morning. Okay. So, so I think um, we're all at home. It's after six <laughs> o'clock. We're, we're finishing our work day. So <laughs> cheers to that. We're, we're ready for a few of these. So as I said before, um, you know, a lot of people don't look at uh, setting up a vineyard or a winery as a, as a wise investment. But I think if you've got the passion and the drive to do it, you, are, you become successful. Now, Cashburn, we made Cashburn for the first time in 2008, which was the first year that we took a small parcel of fruit off the Burn Cottage Vineyard. So we planted the Burn Cottage Vineyard pretty much between 2003 and 2008. And you know, you get one chance to go to the market and put your stake in the ground and say, this is Burn Cottage. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, we thought, you know what, this isn't quite the year that we want to do that. So cash burn came about. And to be fair, cash burn was really just taking the mickey out of Marcus with the amount of cash he burnt setting up the vineyard. And as you'll see in the label there, <laughs> that, beautiful, that beautiful lady with a whole pile of notes there and a box of matches so basically burning cash <laughs> literally burning day. her cash yeah, literally burning cash yeah <laughs> so i think for us cash burn has always got this lovely it's got this lovely bright red fruit sort of flavors about it so it's sort of cherries raspberries it's got a little bit of a savory sort of edge to it as well and just really nice soft soft you know silky tannin structure as well um this is always this wine has a lot of spice on it as well. Yeah, it really developed yeah. like cinnamon cherry cola thing. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah. So we use a in, in the ferments. We always keep a portion of the bunch as whole, so we keep the stems on. So that that whole bunch ferment does give that sort of like nice sort of savory spice, sort of slight sort of cinnamony, peppery sort of notes to it as well. I think it's delicious and I'm super excited that, like I've said a million times, I'm super excited to be drinking this again. Cool. I, I love it. So, so tell there's, us a there's little- There's one quick disclaimer yeah. I'm gonna let you know about though. So the, 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 the Cashburn 2017 is the last year we've made. Because <gasps> what we found is- Andy, my what, bottle's oh, empty now. <laughs> you better go buy some more. So what we, what we do is we put Burn Cottage Vineyard together, we put Moonlight Race together, and then the little parcel that was left became cash burn. But what we found over the last few years is that the quality was just going up and up and up. So we actually didn't have any cash burn level wine. So we made the call um, to stop making it. So it's going to be Moonlight Race and Burn Cottage Vineyard. So if you're, if you're running short, might pay to grab it now because we, we basically... The, the U.S. Is the, is the only market that has it. So if you, if you want this to- It's going to be now. worth a lot, guys. It's going to be worth a lot. <laughs> How would you say the ageability is then for this wine being it's 2017 already? And I know that harvest already happened for you guys, what, in February? And just like how, again, I know we talked about Stelvin screw cap closures and aging wines and stuff like that. Do you see this as something that could be a collectible wine? Yeah, this, this is more so the, so the early to medium. Like I, I was drinking some 2014 of this uh, two weeks ago and it's just got really lovely savory and it's got more savory. It's got, you know, the acidity started to soften off really nicely, but it's still got this lovely sort of pingy, crunchy, cranberry, raspberry character in the back of it. But yeah, I, I, we, we all sort of talk about cash burn sort of being early to, to medium sort of term drinking, whereas obviously Moonlight Race and Burn Cottage Vineyard have... Age, you know, more serious sort of ageability. Sure. All right. So, why don't you tell us a little bit of mo a little bit more about uh, what else there is to do? I touched on the region, just kind of generally speaking. But as somebody who lives there, and for those of you guys who aren't coming from Houston, these are your other options uh, with traveling to uh, New Zealand. But tell us a little bit more about about your home and about what you think are, are the highlights. As somebody who lives there and spends a lot of time there, what, what do you wake up every morning seeing and still feel like this is exciting or this is pretty, this is pretty 
remarkable. So this is this this is home for me. So this is Wanaka. So this is where I live. So I wake up in the morning, and that big mountain range to your left, I can see that out of our bedroom window. And my office that I'm sitting in at the moment, I can look to the right and another mountain range. So to me, you know, we are in the middle of this amazing valley system with amazing mountains. We've got lakes. And to me, I love Queenstown. Queenstown is an amazing, amazing place. And it's the airport that you fly into to get here. But I, I've just got such a soft spot for Wanaka. This is uh, a hike, which is about a, I don't know, about a five, six hour return hike um, called Roy's Peak, which is about a 20 minute drive from where I live. Or not even that, about 15 minutes drive from where I live now. This is now the most Instagram spot in the whole of New Zealand. So what you see there is one person jumping. What you don't see in the background is probably 40 or 50 people lined up to get the ultimate uh, You can <laughs> see all, all the footprints in the snow, even yeah, if you look yeah. closely, just how many have, have kind of tread up that same little walkway. Yeah. But if you're into hiking, the, you've got amazing hikes all across the region. You've got stuff that can take a day, a couple of hours, or you can do multi-day hikes. And I know, uh, Kristen, we were talk, you were talking about the Milford track before. You know, and again, the Milford track, you can do it on a budget or you can just go crazy. You know, you can have somebody basically carry your pack in, you turn up at the hut, they cook dinner for you, you can drink bottles of wine, or you can load them into your own pack, carry it all in yourself, stay in the huts that are a little bit more, you know, budget orientated. So you know, you've got all extremes, which I think, you know, is a great way to be able to do it. I loved it. I, uh, we did it with ultimate hikes when we were there. So we had oh. the little lodges and what was great about the lodges, we carried our own bags, but yep. each lodge had its own little washing station and a super, super hot sauna. So you could switch into your night clothes and put your, like wash your, wiki, your, your hiking clothes have them fully dried by the time you went to bed that night while you sit and enjoy a glass of wine and actually have conversations with people in the middle of this really beautiful, removed part of the world. And it was super memorable for, for me. And I know there are a couple of other people on the call here as well who, uh, who have done the track. And cool. def definitely glad I didn't camp though. Yeah. Yeah, and it's amazing what happens when you don't have Wi-Fi, eh? Mm -hmm. You have to talk to people. <laughs> I know, and I remember there was a there was a young woman who uh, was doing the hike with her mom, who at the time was uh, a few years younger than I was, and she was from Auckland, and she was talking about how unusual it was for them to be tourists in their own country and to fly from yeah. Auckland down to Queenstown and essentially take a vacation and do this hike that they were always like, oh, we'll do it one day. We'll do it one day yeah, we'll, yeah. when we find the time. And it's so easy for them to get to, for, for you guys to get to and to access on, on any occasion. And um, it is just interesting how like, especially now we're all kind of forced to look inward a little bit into our own um, countries when it comes to travel and when it comes to how th things are happening around the world. And being in New Zealand, being in Australia, being in the United States, we're all looking at how much possibility our own country has in terms of things to do and things to see and, and just bucket list destinations that don't necessarily require a 17 hour flight. Oh, I totally agree. And, and we've seen that obviously, you know, New Zealand came out of lockdown a couple of months ago. And this is the time of year that people take off to Bali, they take off to Australia for, a, for their winter break. But obviously, with the borders being closed, everybody's traveling domestically. So, you know, the local ski fields, for example, had predicted a 50% downturn in visitors. They had days bigger than last year. So exactly that, people are going, you know what? I still haven't done the Tongari Road crossing. I haven't been to Nelson. Right. I'm not going overseas for the next 12 months, so let's spend that money and visit our own country. So it's, it's been fantastic to see. Well, and you don't have people, I, I feel like as being in the travel industry and seeing domestic travel just kind of flourishing on, on my end here in the United States, stuff is selling out like crazy. And I think a part yeah, of that has yeah. to do with just how 
when, when you plan a trip to New Zealand as an American, you've got your 17 hour flight to get there and you've got maybe 10 or 12 days on the ground and then everyone's doing it, but you're a little spaced out and there might be one set of dates that's entirely sold out for something, but it's not the same way it used to be. And everyone has like one or two of those trips they do and then nobody else is traveling yeah. uh, the rest of the time. But when we're traveling yeah. local, it's so much easier to squeeze in three or four or five day trips rather than a full week commitment and have them overlap and then do it again and do it again and do it again. Yeah, and yeah. you're just seeing these places, you're just seeing no availability at these places because of local tourists who are actually experiencing their, their home country. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think as well, like, I think like those flights from the States to New Zealand are long. Like I, I spend, I, I do quite a bit, a few visits every year to the States with, with my job. Those flights actually not so bad. If you leave, if you leave the US on the late night flights, you get in, you have a sleep, you take melatonin, you wake up. It's not, it's not as bad as it sounds. But my, I reckon my biggest tip for people coming or planning a trip to New Zealand, don't try and do too much. I think right. what we see is a lot of people come to New Zealand and try to cover the whole two islands in a 10 day period or a 14 day period. And they always have regrets that they didn't stop and visit places a little bit longer or have enough time. I always say to people, look, if you're coming to New Zealand, if you can afford to do it across two trips, do it across two trips. Do your first trip to the South Island or the North Island and get the second one vice versa. Then you get the chance to really immerse yourself and have that luxury of stopping an extra day if you get somewhere that you really love. Because we all know it's nothing worse than getting back home and going, you know what, we should have stayed an extra day there. It would have been just perfect. I'm so glad you said that because I, I had that experience. Well, I was fortunate enough to spend almost a month in New Zealand. And even oh. in that time, all at once. And even in that time, I spent most of my time on the South Island. And when I send clients to New Zealand, I always try, the, the worst thing you can do is try to combine Australia and New Zealand because they are so different. And from Houston, we have direct flights to both, so it's easy to yep. make them two separate trips. And they are entirely different destinations. And the packing list for one can be different than the packing list for the other. But yeah, yeah. Even when we were putting together this wine uh, presentation for today, I told Adele, "There's no way we can do the North and the South Island in one presentation. We have to do the South Island separately from the North Island because stylistically they're different, and just the things that." everything else there is to do is just different and I would never say you can do it all in one trip and so we're not trying to do it all in in one presentation either yeah and I, and I think that's it but one one of the things that is across both na both both islands is you know we are we are a friendly nation you know it's a, it's a relatively mm. safe country to travel in we, we we you know we're really dependent on tourism in New Zealand so you know, we're set up for tourism. We love having tourists here. And it, you're, well, we, you, the people that have been here always talk about the friendly hospitality that New Zealanders have as, as part of their sort of DNA. And we hope that sort of, you know, will encourage people to come back once once the borders are fully open again. I think how are, how, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, like, how are things there, although you guys can't leave and no one can come in, uh, but how, how are things going out to eat or just other ordinances and cases and stuff like that? So at the moment we've got um, like the repatriation flights coming back into New Zealand. People are being uh, kept in uh, facil like facilities, quarantine facilities. Um, we, we, we're just back to normal. So we can go out for dinner, we can go out shopping, we can do whatever we want basically. Um, but not to say that we're mindful that there could be, you know, a second wave at some stage. But, you know, we're fortunate that it's been handled, you know, pretty faultlessly in New Zealand. You know, it does help that we are a small, small nation. But in saying that, we, you know, I think people have realised pretty quickly how serious it was in New Zealand. And as our Prime Minister said, you know, we're a team of five million and it's about all working together for the, you know, for the good of the whole country. So... Yeah, I think it's it's been it's been a unique experience, and I think we're all feeling that globally. And hopefully, you know, 
in the next few years we'll look back and go, okay, well that was pretty pretty hard, but we've got the benefits of it now. And you know, once the borders are open, we can travel, and it'll it'll sort of it'll be a distant memory, hopefully. I think so, you guys yeah. are the the shining star of examples for just how when it comes to how everything hap has happened over the past couple of months. And um, I know I can't wait till the time that I can visit New Zealand again. And I'm sure uh, our guests who haven't been are excited to, to go and those who have, uh, have really fond memories. Uh, I do, also I love that you included this place in your presentation. Um, this is the Lindis, right? Yeah, yeah. I love this property. It's unreal. Yeah. But I do want to open up the floor. We are we are a little bit over time, so I do just want to open up the floor uh, to anybody who might want to ask you some questions. We've uh, answered a couple of them as we've gone along, but if anybody would like to uh, chat with Andy or ask him questions about the wine, about the vineyard, uh, now is your opportunity. And you can unmute yourselves. Cool. Yeah, the Lindus is an like the lodges that you talked about before, Kristen. So Blanket Bay, Matakauri, um, and Minaret Station, all amazing lodges. Actually, actually, that most of those poor burn cottage on the properties. The Lindus, I was fortunate to visit there about 12 months ago. It's about an hour's 20 drive or so from Queenstown. It is unbelievable. You've got some of the most amazing um, trout fishing. Uh, rivers that run through there as well and it is yeah it's just jaw-droppingly gorgeous as are most of the lodges throughout New Zealand. And this property has one room that is or a, a suite I guess that's removed from uh, the rest of the property that has glass walls all around it but they're mirrored so nobody can see in but you can see out so if you like yeah. stargazing it's this super experiential unusual Thing that you can do when you're visiting the Lindis. Uh, I have clients who were supposed to be here back in the spring and they've got a future trip credit at this property and I can't wait for them to be able to uh, actually visit it and, and experience it for themselves in person. It's unreal. Yeah, the, the quality of lodges in, in this region and across the country are, you know, are, are world class and I think a lot of the feedback people get is that you know we've never been looked after as well and the, you know the, the produce in New Zealand is amazing you know we have some of the best seafood in the world obviously our meat is amazing our produce that we grow is fantastic and we've got you know a, most of the lodges have amazing chefs who treat the produce with such respect and you get amazing food and obviously local wines serve with it as well so it's yeah just a really unique experience and hey who wouldn't want to wake up with that as your as your sort of view from the bed? That's pretty amazing, eh? Yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty special country. Well, Andy, I want to if we don't have any more questions, I, last I call, two, guys. Oh, yeah, go two ahead. Questions. Um, and this is one of those like we live in Houston, it's a huge city with lots of light pollution, and a couple times people have mentioned how beautiful the night sky is across New Zealand. Yeah. Um, you said I think you lived like in the city that had that beautiful bay view is where you live you can even still see like more than 10 stars oh gosh yeah you can see so um elon musk has um oh, we, we can we can see those with the naked eye like i can i can sit outside my like sit on the lawn outside the house here at night and it's just jet black skies with pinpricks of stars everywhere and um, as a like a wine food tourism question, I'm super jealous of that description of the night sky. Um, wine food tourist uh, question. So it's great to hear that like all these lodges and everywhere has this great connection with wine. One of the things that I've noticed when I've gone to even like California wine region um, is so often places, and definitely this is a thing in New York, um, places will have when I go to restaurants, you go to largest places will have um, lots of a, a decent representation of local wines. And then we'll always make sure to kind of like check the boxes for Europe and check the boxes for one or two other regions. When you go to a restaurant or are staying at one of these lodges in New Zealand, 
Um, is that kind of still the, what you see or is there that much more emphasis on New Zealand because there's um, that sense of pride and ownership? Well, I think it, it's a combination thing. There's, there was, there's always going to be that pride of the local produce, the local wines, but also a lot of the feedback that we, we get in the region is that, you know, visitors coming here, they want to try as many of the local wines as they can because they know what Cote de Rhone tastes like, they know what good Bordeaux tastes like, they know what Sancerre tastes like, but they want to experience what's here. So there, are, there is always going to be, I think, in this region, a heavy weighting for the local wines. But then I think you're seeing more and more a really good selection from across other regions, not only with, within New Zealand, but also you know, from Australia, from the Loire, from Chile, from Argentina. So it's a, it's a really global eclectic list as well. Um, but we see it locally that the majority of visitors coming to the region want to taste something from the Bendigo sub-region or from Cromwell Basin or from Lowburn and places like that. So they can, they can go home and go, wow, I had a really unique wine experience. And yes, there, there are the international wines there if they want them as well. And most of them are you know, a really outstanding selection. But, um, you know, I was looking at when I go on holiday to a wine region, I want to drink as much of the local wine as I can because I know what everything else tastes like. Um, but there is... You won't be there, there is a wine bar in Queenstown, though, and Mary, I would have to look up the name to be certain, but I, uh, I, sh I shared it with some clients at the beginning of the year that does focus on European wines, and it kind of has that 13 Celsius feel where it has more of the, it, it has a good representation there, but um, being a bar for, you know, also the local crowd, uh, mm -hmm. obviously, they're, they're close to Central Otago and to wine region, and that's exciting, but it's also exciting for people who are there every day to taste stuff that yeah. isn't from next door. And it's, yeah. uh, there, there are some little bars that have that, that focus. A, this Queenstown's a very international, it has a very international crowd during like the summer and winter seasons. Oh, and yeah. that's awesome, awesome that they have that for the locals. Cause that makes sense to me. New Zealand sounds so exotic. I it's, have a question. For yes. Andy, that's not wine related. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be in your beautiful country and did the Milford track with my husband. And um, we absolutely loved it. We were there for 12 days um, or 14 days, something like that. Can't remember. But anyway, what is it between the Australians and the New Zealands? We saw some interactions and you sort of alluded to that with the artist. What's going on between the um, Kiwis and the Aussies? I think it's a similar relationship to Americans and Canadians. You know, it's a bit of rivalry, but at the end of the day, we, we, we you know, we back each other. But it's a, it's a nice, it's like sibling rivalry, I suppose. You know, it's like two kids that, you know, grow up together and you'll always have a bit of banter back and forth, but at the end of the day, you still love each other a bit. So I think it's just a, yeah, it's just a rivalry, but it's not a, it's nothing um, untoward or anything. It's a, free, it's a friendly rivalry. <laughs> We heard some banter that if they were my kids, I would have washed their mouths out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kristen, like, do you, know, you remember that? There's always, <laughs> there's always people who probably take but, it a step too far. <laughs> yeah. But I loved your country. It was absolutely gorgeous. And the people oh, were wonderful. wonderful. Thank you. And the wine too. Yeah. And Adele, well, I, you said you had a question as well? I did. And it was just kind of like my own wine nerd question and stuff like that. Um, just on the, the, the note where the natural wine movement is like a thing that's happening. And I just didn't know if you or any of your neighbors were experimenting with like any natural wine, unusual varietals or ways of making wine. Or I know like there's a producer, they're called Candeli that we get here. That's like a natural yeah. wine cult producer. Yeah. But I didn't know if anyone else like stood out to you as like up and coming really cool. So there's a, a really, there, there's definitely, a, you know, people really getting into the natural wine uh, movement here. I think for me, probably one of the top people would be a guy called Theo Coles. who's got his own winery called the Hermit Ram, which is based up in Canterbury. So just outside, of, just by Christchurch. Um, he's doing some really cool stuff. He is an amazing, wonderful person, really cool wines as well. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's like a lot of people, you know, people we, as in the wine industry, there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of you know, playing and trying new things as well. 
um, we're seeing more people, you know, there's, there's a lot of people down here sort of having trial with, you know, reducing sulfur uh, usage and things like that and playing with different varietals. I know we've got Gruner Veltliner planted, which is a little Austrian variety that we decided to have a play with. There's people like Mount Edward in the local region growing it, um, Quartz Reef also doing it as well. So I think there's, you know, people having a play with, with varieties and just different ways of making the wines as well. Good question. Well, does anybody have any last questions before we say goodbye and sign off tonight? Let Andy get over to the winery. All right. Well, thank you cool. again, Andy. It was so wonderful to have you. Oh, and thank you. Thank you. It was super fun. And thank you for staying on for so long to, to chat with everyone and tell us a Thanks bit about uh, her photos home. too. Like, yeah. That those are really cool. Cool, no worries. And like I said, you know, if you guys do make it down to New Zealand, once the world is sort of back to some sort of resemblance of a normal, would love to host you at the Burn Cottage Vineyard. And if you want a tour guide for a couple of days, I'm happy to, you know, show you the local region because I think it's just such a, an amazing part of the world. And, you know, we, we love having people here from overseas. I think we'll all take you up on that at some point. Fantastic, fun deal. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll cool. see Thank you guys you. next week. We'll be visiting South Africa. It's also my birthday, so we've got a few extra special things planned for you guys. And, and a couple surprises that Kristen doesn't know about. Wait, wait. Uh-oh. Well, have a great week, guys. And thank you again to Andy. And we will see you guys uh, on yes. August 12th. Cheers. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you.